Good evening, everyone. This is Barbara. I'm here for the CPD month with Brelt. And today we'll have Sergio Pantoja talking about the importance of language awareness for teachers. Uh, Sergio is a CELT P and CELT S tutor for Sao Paulo Open Center and also a freelance teacher trainer. He has been in the ELT field since 2002, having worked as an English teacher, teacher trainer, and speaking examiner. He holds, among others, the CPE, a degree in languages, a postgraduate degree in English language teaching and translation, a TESOL certificate from the University of Oregon, USA, and the Delta. Wow. His Delta module three specialism focused on language development for teachers. Sergio, thank you very, very much for being here with us. It's a pleasure on behalf of all the Braille team. We're very honored to have you here. And without further ado, I'll give you Sergio Pantoja. Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So it's a uh, well, thanks for the invitation, uh, Barbara. And thanks for the lovely introduction. It's a it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to have been invited by by Brout. Um, and now I'm going to start by by sharing my my presentation with you. All right. Great. So can you can you all see uh, my presentation? Is it full screen? Yes, it is. Great. OK, so tonight I'm going to be talking about the importance of language awareness in our continued professional development. And but before I start, I'd like to remind you that um, Brout's going to raffle a spot in one of my courses, the Language Development for Teachers uh, course. Um, if you're not sure whether this course is for you, uh, I'm going to give you some information. So the course consists of 20 online sessions. Um, it starts on July 22nd. The sessions are going to be delivered on Mondays from 8 to 9 p.m. And if you want to, to register to take part in this raffle, go to bit.ly slash Brout S004. Uh, and the raffle will be held uh, this Friday at 7 p.m. So good luck. <laughs> Great. And I always forget to share my, uh, my contact with you, so I'm going to start by sharing it too. So if, uh, if I say something throughout the presentation that you don't agree with or would like to discuss further, so here's my email. Uh, I'm also on Facebook and Instagram, so it's very easy for you, e easy for you to find me. Uh, my my email is sergiopantojaelt at gmail.com. My Facebook is sergiopantojajr, uh, and my Instagram is sergiopantojaelt. Okay, so if there's there's something if I'm not able to answer your question or to uh, well to to talk to you about anything that I'd like to, feel free to contact me, and I'll be more than happy to continue this conversation later on. Okay. Right, so by the end of this webinar, we have discussed uh, what language awareness is, uh, some of the challenges that we may face with regards to language awareness, and some possible solutions. Okay, so I, I can't see the chat, but I'd like to pose a question here, and, uh, and maybe Barbara can help me with that. So I'm going to give you a, a few seconds for you to try and um, come up with a definition about language awareness. So if you were to define what language awareness is, or, or your understanding of language awareness, uh, how would you define it? Okay, Barbara, do we have do we have anything? 
I'm here looking at the YouTube chat. Some people have already said good evening, hello, hi, yes, yes, we can hear you, but no definitions of language awareness yet. Okay. So no problem. I'm going to share my definition with you. Actually, it's not my definition. It's uh, Thornberry's, uh, but it's the one that that I've I've chosen to share with you tonight. So Thornberry describes uh, language awareness as explicit knowledge about language. That's All another... right. Yes. There is there is one. Tasia Lorena. She said, "Being uh -huh. able to identify structures and functions." Okay, great. Yes, it's it's related to our uh, our explicit knowledge about the language. In other words, how much we know about English. Uh, so it, this is exactly what Thurnov says. And just to give an example of the importance of language awareness, um, I would like to show you this conditional here. Uh, the other day, I posted this conditional on my Instagram, and I asked it, uh, some of the teachers who follow me whether it's correct or incorrect. Uh, you probably can see it on the screen. It's, I will I will give you $100 if it will help you go on holiday. And most of the people who answered my, my question thought that this conditional is wrong. And it's apparently, um, lots of people might say that it's wrong because you have will and will both in the if clause as well as in the uh, main clause. But believe it or not, this is correct. Uh, and what's going to enable us to tell whether this condition is correct or incorrect is our knowledge about the language. In other words, our language awareness. So if our uh, knowledge about the language uh, is limited to, to the course book you are teaching, if we're just using to that, uh, the labels that course book use, uses, um, they use when they are describing conditionals such as uh, first conditional, second conditional, third conditional, chances are that when you when you come across this conditional, you're going to see, you're going to say that it's wrong. Uh, but in fact, it's it's correct. Uh, another example is why there is an intrusive ye sound between say and it, and why there is a wa sound between you and r. So once again, I we can explain why there we have these into these two intrusive sounds because we have good language awareness. If we don't, probably we're not able to say why we have two intrusive sounds uh, in between these two words. And another example is if you look at sentences number one and number two, you're going to see that we have uh, farther and further. And in both sentences one and two, the use of farther and further are interchangeable, whereas number three and number four only further is correct. So these are very, very simple examples, but um, I think they, they serve their purpose here, which is to exemplify why language awareness is important. Because without that, we're not able to explain how language works. Uh, but I'm going to try to go a little bit beyond Thurnabry's definition. Uh, remember that Thurnabry described language awareness as uh, explicit knowledge about language. But I'd also, I'd also like to present another definition which, co which comes from Andrews. And Andrews defines language awareness as knowledge about language and knowledge of language. And here he makes a distinction between knowledge about versus knowledge of. When he talks about knowledge about language, He's referring to uh, the same thing as Thornberry's. In other words, explicit knowledge about language. But he also brings something else to the table, which is knowledge of language. And knowledge of language here refers to language proficiency. So I think that it's important to consider these two because uh, Leandro's definition is slightly broader than Thornberry's. Now, given these two definitions here, the idea of knowledge about versus knowledge of or uh, explicit knowledge and language profici proficiency, I would like to pose another question. Uh, given the fact that most of us are non-native English speaking teachers, uh, in your opinion, which of these two, knowledge about language and knowledge of language, poses the biggest challenge to us? Is it number one or number two? If you could type uh, on the chat, and then Barbara can tell me uh, whether you, you have chosen one or two.
while they come up with their answers, I can tell you that two other people contributed to your first question. And mm -hmm. that's great. Said that it's control of language. And Fernanda Viganó said, being able to understand that language be, no, being able to understand that language is constantly changing and keep up with it. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's absolutely true, Fernanda. Okay, so anything yet? No answers yet. Okay. People, there are lots of people watching. They just they're just timid, I think. Okay, they're a little bit shy. No problem. <laughs> uh, so, yes, uh, research shows, and maybe it's not going to come as a surprise to you, but uh, given the fact that we are non-native English-speaking teachers, uh, we tend to have more problems with knowledge of language, which is language proficiency. Uh, once again, just to remind you, knowledge about language refers to ex our explicit knowledge about the language, whereas knowledge of language, language proficiency. Yes. Uh, now, I can see some of the comments here. Uh, Fernanda says that maybe two, right? Uh-huh. Yes. yes, knowledge yeah. of language. Yes. So language proficiency tends to pose the biggest challenge because we, as, as again, once again, as we are non-native English speaking teachers, the way we have learned English uh, helps us to make more sense about the way the language works. I mean, in comparison with uh, someone who's a native speaker and uh, learned the language, let's say, more naturally. Uh, so, so much so that in 1994, uh, does anybody here know this man? Okay, his uh, name is Peter Magisch. Uh, he's a Hungarian English teacher. And in 1994, he wrote a book called The Non-Native Teacher. Uh, this is a new edition. If you haven't read this book yet, I, I strongly recommend that you do. It's, it's really insightful. Uh, and there are lots of things that you're going to read and probably it's gonna get you to, to think about uh, more in depth about the the differences between native and non-native English teachers. But there, there's something else he did in 1994, which was to conduct a survey on self-perceptions of non-native English speaking teachers. And what he did was to interview 216 English teachers from 10 different countries and 92% of them described themselves as non-native English speaking teachers. Now, uh, here's another question. Uh, I'd like you to think about the percentage of teachers who admitted to having difficulties with the English language and the percentage of teachers who admitted that their language difficulties had hampered their teaching effectiveness. So what do you think? Do you think it was more than 50%, less than 50%? Tasia said, probably less. Thank you. OK, so let me share with you the, the results. So 84% admitted to having difficulties with the English language, and 75% admitted that their language difficulties had affected their teaching effectiveness. Uh, yes, yeah, so 84% and 75%. So as you can see here, the, the struggle is real. and. When we think about the, some of the, the problems that that a low level of proficiency can uh, or how it can impact our our teaching, I have considered here some of the classroom implications, and uh, there are a few of them that I'd like to share with you tonight. The first one is teachers who, I mean, by and large, teachers who have low a low level of language proficiency tend to try and control 
students' output. So some of the things that you can see when you observe lessons is that uh, teachers who are not very confident and comfortable with their own English, they try to, to control what students are going to produce because it's, it's easier to deal with uh, language that is predictable um, as opposed to emergent language. So the, the idea here is, um, and once again, I know that I'm making a generalization, but uh, in my experience, I can tell you that when I observe lessons and, uh, and, and teachers are not comfortable with their own English, they, try, they always try, whether it's uh, conscious or unconscious, they try to control what their students are going to produce. Um, and then they tend to resort to approaches that uh, somehow are going to allow them to do that. So the practice is going to be more controlled um, and production is going to be more controlled uh, as well. The second point is about correcting errors. Uh, and now I'd like to share uh, a story with you, something that happened to me um, some time ago. I was observing a lesson and uh, during the practice and produc production stages, the students were making lots of mistakes and uh, the teacher wasn't correcting any of those mistakes. And I thought that the teacher had decided not to correct the mistakes for some specific reason. But having watched her lesson, I was giving her feedback at the end of the, the lesson. And when I asked her why she hadn't corrected those mistakes, uh, she told me that she hadn't realized that students were making mistakes. So once again, depending on, on our level of proficiency or uh, how low our level of proficiency is, we may not, be, we may not even be able to, to notice that students are making mistakes and uh, give them effective feedback. The third point is about teaching at the point of need. Uh, most of the time when we think about uh, mistakes and errors, we tend to associate those with, uh, with grammar mistakes. But sometimes students are going to produce sentences that are uh, grammatically correct. However, uh, they may sound a little bit off or unnatural. And then it, it's, it's up to us to notice how we can help them to restructure what they've said so they can sound more natural. So even if the sentence is grammatically, uh, grammatically correct, maybe it's lexically inaccurate, if you like. Uh, and once again, something that I've realized is that uh, when teachers are not very comfortable with their own English, it's hard for them to notice that what students said could have been said in a more natural, in a more effective way. So uh, these are the kinds, kinds of things that tend to go unnoticed if teachers don't have a very high level of proficiency and are able to, to pay attention to their students' production and help them restructure what they said uh, better. Last but not least, Uh, we have the problem of taking advantage of emergent language. Sometimes uh, students are going to produce language that is not what we had planned, what we had predicted. But, but, but then again, we can, we can take advantage of the fact that they have produced uh, language to, uh, to explore that, to, um, to take advantage of the language that's being produced to go further and focus on uh, maybe different collocations, um, expressions, or things that uh, could have said or could have uh, could have said or could have been done differently. But then again, uh, depending on our level of proficiency, we may not be able to to take advantage of that and, uh, and and to to make the most of the opportunities that we have in the classroom. Still on the topic of language proficiency, the other day I posed the following question on my, on my Instagram. Uh, and the question was, do you think there should be a minimum level of proficiency for people who want to start teaching English? 104 teachers have responded and uh, 95 teachers said yes, that there should be uh, a minimum level of proficiency for people who want to start teaching English. And nine people said no. Then I went on to ask, which level should it be? Should it be A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, or C2? And before I share, I share with you the results, uh, once again, I'd like to ask you, do you think that more people ended up choosing uh, which of these levels?
Mm -hmm. I can see here on the chat that Thaisa says that I always try to use emergent language to help my students. Uh -huh, fantastic. Yes, you should always try to, to make the most of emergent language, definitely. Regarding the levels, I think people might have been between B2 and C1. This is what I think people answered. Mm -hmm. uh, in between B2 and C1? Yes. Great, you are absolutely right. Uh, so 104 people answered and uh, responded uh, to my first question, but only 68 uh, have chosen a specific level. So 1.5% said A1, one point, also 1.5% 1 said A2, then 13.3% said B1, as, as Barbara uh, predicted, 35.4% said B2, and 42.7% said C1. So uh, most of the people who responded ended up choosing either B2 or C1, and only 5.6% said C2. And then yeah, everybody guessed alike on, on YouTube as well. Renata, Tassia, and Wanius all said C1 or B2. Great. I, yeah, I, I, I can see that, that most people ended up choosing either C1 or, or B2. Yes. Uh, and, and then I, I, was, I was asked what my, what my take is on this issue. And I don't want to, to duck the question. Uh, even though I posed the question myself, I know it's a, it's a very complicated one in the sense that it's a, I think this question is, is highly uh, context dependent. Uh, because there are lots of things you need to take in, into consideration, such as uh, uh, where this teacher teaches, where uh, the, the levels that he's going to teach or the, the students. Ideally, I know that the higher, the better. And, and this is what I believe. But it's, it's hard to, to define what the minimum level of proficiency should be uh, because there are many, many things involved. But if we think about the CELTA, for example, Uh, yeah, Julio says in a dream world. Uh, yes, that's right, Julio. Uh, one of the things that I, I pointed out is that uh, if all the teachers whose level of English is below C1 or below B2 had to stop teaching because uh, most of the people thought that either B2 or C1 is the minimum level of proficiency that a teacher should have, I think that uh, most teachers in Brazil wouldn't be teaching. So yes, uh, this is something that we need to take into consideration. But then I, again, ideally, the higher the better. Uh, probably you, 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 you guys know that in order for you to take the CELTA, you need to have a C1 level of proficiency, right? Even if you don't have uh, a certificate such as the CAE, but the tutor is gonna talk to you to make sure that you have the right level of proficiency so that you can keep up with the course. So uh, maybe that's one of the reasons why people have chosen, I mean, most people, not most people, but uh, yeah, I think it's most people, right? Yeah, 42.7% 42, 42 uh, have chosen C1, uh, maybe due to the fact that you need, that's the level you need to have in order to take the CELTA. Uh, but I think there are other reasons um, that a level of, a low level of proficiency uh, can affect uh, our teaching and our career. Uh, here you can see some more uh, specific books, some technical books. One of them is Teaching by Principle by H. Douglas Brown. Um, and this book is uh, very memorable to me because I tried to read this book when I started teaching a long time ago, and I failed spectacularly because I wasn't able to read it. Uh, when I started teaching, my level of proficiency was so low that I wasn't even able to read this book. <laughs> and, and little did I know that the problem was because it was because my English wasn't good enough. Uh, and nowadays, with the, the benefit of hindsight, when I, I still have this book and now whenever I need it and I read it, I see that what prevented me from reading it and understanding it was, uh, was my own English. So... Uh, this is a problem. People with low level of proficiency may have problems to uh, access a more technical books. 
Also, when, when we teach, uh, in order for us to be able to teach a wide range of levels, we also, once again, we need to have a high level of proficiency. Uh, otherwise, you end up teaching the same basic level. I'm not saying that uh, asking uh, teachers with a lower level of proficiency to teach basic levels is correct, but this is what tends to happen most in some schools. Uh, school owners tend to ask teachers with lower levels of proficiency to teach more basic levels. Uh, but I think that if, if, it's, if we uh, uh, plan and if we, have, if we intend to teach higher levels, we need to, we need to strive to become better and better, uh, especially uh, given the fact that in, in currently you have more and more um, teenagers and, uh, and children studying at the bilingual schools. Uh, and it's something that you, and taking, and taking uh, Cambridge exams, for example, something that wasn't that common 10 or 15 years ago. And, and then again, the problem or, or the issue with uh, establishing a minimal level of proficiency is even though it's, it's very complex and, uh, and there's more to it than meets the eye, it's something that happens in, in it happens in real life. Uh, when schools are looking for teachers, they tend to uh, set a minimal level of proficiency in order to hire teachers. Uh, some of the most prestigious schools tend to hire teachers whose level of proficiency is C1 and C2. So I, I would say that this is something that whether we, we like it or not, it's, it's inevitable. So we should try and, uh, and do our utmost to become better and better. Okay, uh, in addition to some of the challenges that I've already mentioned, there's also something that uh, only, only recently have I, have I read about, which is uh, the issue of fossilization. Whenever we come across this word, we tend to associate with uh, errors and mistakes, right? Uh, can you think how fossilization can be related to uh, our proficiency? Any ideas? Mm -hmm. I'm keeping an eye on the chat here, so if you, if you want to have a go at it, I'll be able to read your comments before I tell you how it's related to the issue of proficiency. Okay, Hinata says students' mistakes. Mm -hmm. That's right, Hinata. Most of the time, the word uh, fossilization is related to students' mistakes, right? So students keep making the same mistake for a long time. They are not corrected. They don't uh, uh, get feedback. And then that mistake fossilizes. So this is the context where fossilization is uh, mostly uh, found. However, Farrell suggests that uh, the, the problem with fossilization can also uh, happen with regards to our level of proficiency. He says that uh, since the teacher is typically teaching students of limited language proficiency, the teacher's own classroom language is likely to be intentionally simplified in order to facilitate comprehension. In other words, as we feel that we have, we need to give students a uh, comprehensible input, what we tend to do is to rough tune the language that we use. So we, we're going to, uh, we're going to be using language that is uh, simpler way to speak at a, at a, at a slower uh, at the lower sorry at a slower uh, pace because we want our students to understand us and as a result it's going to in the long run it's going to affect our own English and then he adds that while there is uh, while the strategy the teacher's strategy of providing learners with comprehensible input is desirable from the learner's point of view it can also promote a type of facilitation in the teacher's own language. Over time, due to the restricted type of English they use in the classroom and their restricted opportunities to use or hear normal English, 
their own English fails to develop. Uh, so let me ask you now, is it something that especially those of us who teach mostly basic levels, is this something that you feel that somehow your, your English uh, is, is fossilizing, so to speak, is somehow deteriorating? Some people here says you have commented about uh, what you said. If the teacher has got a good level, he's going to pronounce correctly, and by doing that, it will avoid fossilization. Fernanda also said, perhaps a teacher who was a C2 in late 90s, but haven't done anything about teaching to continue their learning, is not going to be C2 nowadays. Uh-huh, agreed, yes. And personally, now teaching kids, I'm teaching very young learners. My students are three years old, uh, most of them. Um, I, I think, yes, we tend, perhaps not the structures, but definitely, yes, for words, we try to use um, Latin-based words so they can understand more easily. We keep choosing words all the time rather than just letting them come. So I, I do think we get rusty with, with time. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, when, when I talk to teachers, Barbara, this is something, this is a very common complaint. Uh, they say that as, as a result of teaching students that are at very basic levels and uh, trying to provide them with comprehensible input and the fact that they always have to, uh, to adapt the language they use in the classroom, they feel that as time goes by, it's, they, th their English starts to, uh, get rusty and deteriorate. Uh, so, hence the the importance of uh, continuous studying, so that we we it, so that it doesn't happen to us. Mm -hmm. I can also see that there is another comment here. Uh, Thaisa says that yes, because we won't be able to continue practicing speaking with other people who has good level. Uh huh. Yes, uh, Julio says that's not acknowledging that is the main issue here. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. So uh, the point that Farrell makes here, I think it's uh, it's very pertinent in the sense that as we as we we don't have many opportunities to uh, use English at a higher level uh, and talk about more advanced and sophisticated issues, uh, we start to 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 have this problem. Now, what about some solutions? Well. I think that uh, the first thing is what Natalia, uh, Natalia wrote um, a post for Richmond, Richmond Share uh, entitled Teacher Language Development. I'm starting with the woman in the mirror. Uh, and there is one point that she makes, uh, which I think that is the, is the first step towards improvement. Natalia says that we all have our sore spots in terms of language proficiency, hopefully. They change along our language learning history as we study, practice the language, learn more, find other areas that need improvement and address those and so on and so forth. However, to better work on our language difficulties, first, we need to recognize they're there. So I think that this is the first, uh, this is the first thing that we need to do towards improvement is to, to uh, understand and identify that we all, have, we all have problems and we all need to continue learning and improving because uh, sometimes people don't even know that uh, they could benefit from studying more, from taking courses. Uh, so that's, that's definitely the first step. So to, to understand that there's room for, I know it may sound cliche, but it, there's room for improvement and there's always something that we can do to, uh, to become better teachers and better users of the language. And, but when you talk to people, uh, even those who acknowledge the fact that there is room for improvement, there's something they can do to, to be even better than they, current, they currently are. Uh, something that tends to be very recurrent is the problem uh, with time. And someone once said that time is always against us. Can, can anybody uh, guess who said that? Okay, the person who said time is always against us is the great 
Morpheus from the Matrix. <laughs> he said that time is always against us, and it's true. So uh, we as teachers were always uh, complaining about the fact that we don't have enough time to do everything we need. Uh, Renata, Renata says, no idea. Yes, and it's not a it's not a philosopher or or any any anything like that. Uh, but I think that is a, that's a very uh, interesting point because I don't think that we're likely to have more time in the future uh, because we're always teaching more classes and no and taking on more students. So the issue the issue of time is something that we have to find a way to uh, to manage. Um, and then when I was, I was looking for uh, some ideas in order to deal with this problem, I also found or I came across this uh, blog post, which was written by Ricardo Barros. Um, and Ricardo makes a very interesting point, which is about goals. Uh, and it somehow struck a chord with me because I, I also followed the same path as, he, as his. Uh, Ricardo says that I'm the kind of person who needs goals in order to keep myself motivated. Uh, very early in my career, I decided that the best way of forcing myself to study was to enroll for Cambridge exams. They're expensive, so you need to consider how much time you have in your routine in order to study or to take a prep course for it. However, enrolling for an exam or a certificate might force you to carve out the time, which is something positive in and out of itself. And uh, I think this is a, is a great strategy. So uh, if you want to, to improve and you, you maybe depending on the level you, you are, you can think about study in order to get a certificate. Um, if you already have all the certificates, you can think about another goal. But I think it's always important to set a goal because it's, it's going to help you to, uh, to keep on track. So you know exactly uh, where you're going and once you're there, uh, you'll be able to, to measure uh, how far you've come. But there are people that uh, they're not really willing to study and, and take uh, certificates. So there are other courses nowadays that are provided by uh, their great professionals offering uh, courses and also institutions. So if you don't, once again, if you don't have a C1 certificate yet, you can study for it or a C2, or maybe you already have uh, all Cambridge certificates or any other proficiency exam. And you may want to, to further your studies and take a language development for teachers course or something focused more specifically on grammar, vocabulary, pronunciation. So you're going to find lots of great courses out there. Um, but also there's something that things you can do uh, for free, such as uh, there's lots of podcasts that I, 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 I love podcasts. I listen to podcasts um, almost every day. So there, there are great podcasts that you can listen to uh, that not only will help you to improve your, your knowledge about language, <laughs> as well as your knowledge of language, as, as Andrew uh, ex Andrews explains. So we have some of my favorites are the TEFL Commute podcast, uh, where they talk about uh, different issues uh, in ELT. Uh, there are also some podcasts that are more focused on language itself, such as Grammar Girl or Word of the Day, um, One Stop English Podcast, Tefalology, The Tefal Show. So there are many resources out there that you can use in order to, and, and they're completely free that you can use to uh, help and improve you and, and improve your, uh, your English and your knowledge as a teacher. There are also some books, some great books that you can use. Some of these books are more focused on how to teach. Other books are, are, can help you develop your, your own knowledge of grammar uh, and vocabulary. Uh, but then there is a question of consistency, right? Because I think the point is, is, to, is to make a habit out of it. It's not just to do something once every uh, month, but once you, you start studying and you, you, you choose a book, for example, that you, you're going to uh, work your way through to do it consistently. And also when you watch TV shows, I definitely we're gonna watch for fun because we need to, uh, to take a break and, uh, and relax and enjoy. But I think that watching, watching TV shows is also a wonderful for, uh, opportunity for us to notice how language is used. Uh, so maybe for example, we want to get a, to 
get yourself a, le a lexical notebook where you can take notes of how languages use it, expressions, uh, and and many things that you can you can notice by watching uh, a TV series and 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 listening to music. So I think that at the end of the day, we know what what we need to do and we know how to do that. But it's a question of really uh, uh, building a habit so that we can do this as often as possible. Uh, because it's just like you know to draw an analogy here. I think it's just a, a a bucket and that is being filled with water and the, the note the water is dripping and little by little uh, the water the, the bucket's going to get filled so if we, if we even if we do this I don't know, 15 minutes a day or 10 minutes a day uh, the fact that we're doing this consistently is going to, to generate great uh, results in the future and I'd like to uh, wrap it up uh, by sharing one final uh, quote with you. This one uh, is by Luis Otavio. Luis Otavio was recently interviewed by Jack Scholes. And when he was asked about his, his journey, uh, one of the things he said that really resonated with me uh, is this. He says that we should embrace uh, uh, your, you should embrace or we should embrace our non-nativeness and be proud of your journey and aware of your strengths. But don't become complacent about your English and keep in mind there's always room for improvement no matter how proficient you think you are. Don't ever settle for good, for good enough. If you want your place in the sun, you must earn it. And, and this is something that I've always believed. I think that we should always, uh, again, no matter how good we think we are, how proficient we think we are, uh, there's always something that we can do in order to improve um, and uh, be better. So, Thank you very much. Now, if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to, to answer your questions. Sergio, thank you very, very much uh, for tackling such a um, complicated topic in such a subtle way and gentle way. It's, it was amazing to listen to you. My, my pleasure. Uh, Barbara, thanks for the invitation again. It's really hard to, to talk about teachers level of proficiency and how we have to keep on moving forward always right one of my suggestions is always a community practice so count on Brout if you have all camber certificates and you still have um, this bug in you willing to develop and looking for new things new information new courses new people uh, we really believe that this connection is what is keep us moving so Thank you very, very much for all the insights and all the reflections you brought tonight. My, my pleasure. And I, I think that unlike nowadays, we have the privilege of having uh, access to lots of things that maybe most teachers didn't used to have in the past. So uh, there are there is a plethora of resources available on the internet that people can, can resort to in order to improve. There are lots and lots of courses. Uh, I think it's really a question of uh, planning and, and prioritizing our professional development. Yes, that's it. Well, everybody on YouTube is thanking you. Everybody's saying that. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing your knowledge. True, that's very true. Somebody here said that uh, it's funny because it's exactly the same tips we give to our students. And uh, so uh, I, tell them uh, to do it, but don't do it ourselves. Oh, yes. It's Fernanda, right? Fernanda said that. Yes, yes. Yes, uh, yes, Fernanda, I, I, I strongly agree with you. We tend to forget that the same advice fits for us. Uh huh. Yes, this is something that we're always telling our students, right? We tell them how to improve and the things that they should do. But uh, interestingly, I think that when we start, we start teaching because of this hectic routine that we, uh, we always have, it's, sometimes we, it's hard for us to walk the walk. True. So, no questions? Yes, it's just a bunch of thank yous, Sergio. Thank you very, very much. Once again, people, stay tuned for Sergio's first raffle, which will happen on Friday at 7. Is that right? That's right. It's on Friday at 7 o'clock. Yes. So, um, good luck to everybody who's going to 
who has registered or who's going to take part in the raffle. And the course starts on July 22nd. So oh, really looking forward to meeting the winner. Yes, uh, just a little uh, more on the course. I was reading about it the other day because sometimes when we say language development for teachers, I think people uh, automatically connect it to grammar and they keep on grammar, grammar, grammar. Mm -hmm. And um, I saw that it's not only grammar, right? You have uh, lexis, phonology, and lots of things that constitute language. That's absolutely correct. Uh, when yeah, people t they they tend to believe that language development for teachers is a, a course that's going to focus primarily on grammar, uh, but it 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 goes beyond that. So uh, throughout the course, we're going to to talk about well, grammar is definitely one of the things that is going to be discussed and uh, and practiced. But in addition to that, we're also going to address phonology uh, and lexis. Amazing. All right, so everyone stay tuned for all the raffles that are coming this month. We have a series of webinars as well. Tomorrow we're going to have one at 10 a.m. from Culture Inglés about um, different career options. And the other week and the other, and we have Southern Con coming as well. So stay tuned for July because it's going to be a, a month of professional development. Sergio, once again, thank you very much for staying with us. My pleasure, Barbara. Thanks, everyone. See you. Bye-bye. Yeah.